today's lesson is dedicated to paleoclimatology, of course, only a sort of introduction to it, or maybe not an introduction, uh, an overlook of what paleoclimatology is and uh, what it offers, what possibilities it offers, also in terms of comparison of modern and past um, climate, uh, climate conditions. So we'll be talking about climate and, uh, of course, just a short reminder what climate is. So it's a, basically it's a set of parameters like temperature, humidity, atmospheric pressure, wind, precipitation, uh, and also other parameters that can describe uh, the conditions that uh, the conditions of uh, on Earth, but the major difference between climate and weather is actually time, time interval. So, uh, in order to be able to talk about climate conditions uh, in contrast to uh, to the weather, we need a longer time intervals, uh, data sets from longer time time periods. Usually, we talk about thirty years of data, 30 years of, uh, of data sets of, of measurements to compare to, to be able to talk about uh, climate, which is, of course, not the same uh, everywhere on Earth. We have climate zones and it, it, those conditions are influenced by many factors such as altitude, latitude, also water bodies uh, and ocean currents and, and so on. Uh, so. We, we we tend to measure things uh, for all the things that surround us, all the parameters, all the conditions, and it's not only a modern thing or a modern trend. People always try to describe what they were observing, and what you can see here are some examples of very early attempts to um, to, to measure, for example. Uh, cloud and rain formation, uh, to compare weather conditions. So it started many, many years ago, uh, even 3000 year, uh, years uh, before Christ in, in India, for example. There are, of course, only some time timestamps, time marks uh, with some pretty important discoveries or, uh, or inventions, like in the 16th century, where constructed a thermometer. You can see this thermometer on the left. It's not the one that we're using now, at least. Well, this is quite a popular uh, decoration nowadays. It's not, uh, it's not usually used to, to, for measurement. And regular observations of, of weather conditions and in time of, of climate started basically in 19th century. So there are only some some facts and uh, dates, and of course we have recent decades, and recent decades uh, are marked with an increase of interest in climate change. We have modern equipment, we have satellite observations, which changed uh, a lot and to allow us to uh, to observe a lot more accurately and a lot more uh, parameters. So. Um, the regular measurements, like I said, they started back in 19th century. Uh, so it's more than 150 years of regular observations. And what we observe um, that on average times Earth has increased uh, a little bit less than one uh, Celsius degree uh, in, in this uh, during this period. Uh, so. This is what what we can compare because we have records, we have data, we have documents. But uh, what paleoclimatologists seek is uh, is something a little bit different because uh, they're trying to explain some climate variations, uh, but more in, not in the recent past, but even in, in not in terms. Of our times, but more like geologic uh, periods, uh, beginning with the time of the Earth's formation, so uh, a really long, long time ago. Uh, so the, 
where where is data drawn from? The research data is mostly drawn from um, geological research, but also astronomy, atmospheric physics, meteorology, geophysics, uh, botanical research, mostly palo botanical research. So there are lots of different branches of, of science that contribute to paleoclimatology. And again, what is traced by paleoclimatologists is temperature, precipitation, also, for example, salinity of, of water, of ancient uh, oceans. Of course, uh, in some cases, some um, individual events can also be traced and identified, such as uh, big fires, big catastrophes, catastrophic uh, events. Uh, one of the most important terms that is being used in paleoclimatology is a proxy. And proxy is in general something that represents something else indirectly. For example, in some elections, a voter can choose another person to cast the vote and there is voting by proxy, in, at least in, in some countries it is legally uh, possible. So we have many proxies for the past uh, climate, which enable scientists to, to reconstruct those conditions, those climatic conditions uh, from, uh, from the past. They can be used individually, but most, it is most efficient when th those proxies are used uh, or brought together uh, to, to help piece together the past climate of, of course, it's a past climate of particular time period and uh, of particular region, just like, uh, just like today. Uh, if we are going deep into the past, it means that we, and we find something which is a proxy, we'll learn some examples of proxies uh, soon. Uh, we need to uh, place them somewhere in time. So it means that we have to be able to determine their, their age. So uh, there is a variety of analytical techniques which are used to determine the age. Of such, uh, of, of such objects, of, su of such uh, proxy proxies. Uh, so, for, for example, uh, radiocarbon uh, techniques and uh, are, are more 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 popular, but also still uh, counting tree rings, uh, which is also tree rings or uh, trees in general are also a type of proxy and by counting the tree rings marking their uh, annual uh, growth can allow us to uh, to determine uh, to determine how old was the tree for example when it was uh, when it was cut down uh, if we want to determine age we um, we have to be aware of some limitations of determining age. So one of the limitations, but also one of the characteristics of those techniques is so-called resolution. In, in this case, resolution is a time difference between two, two samples. That means uh, this is the um, shortest period of time that we can identify using a one type of the proxy. So the smaller or the shorter this period of time is, that means the higher the resolution and it allows us to determine um, power climate uh, from year to year on, or every 10 years or so. Um, and in some cases, in some proxies, resolution is not that, not that accurate. So this time period is much longer and our findings are not that accurate uh, as well. So we can determine age only between like 100,000 years and uh, give the data from uh, not determining the, the exact moment when the data was drawn. Uh, so here are some examples, only selected examples of, uh, of some proxies. 
And as you remember, the title of this lesson is written, starts with written in the Arctic. So you uh, might identify some of them directly with the Arctic region, but at the end, I will try to prove you that actually many of them, if not all of them are used also in the Arctic to determine uh, ancient past climate in, in this region or, or in polar regions in general. So the first proxy I would like to talk about is uh, pollen. So pollen grains. Pollen grains are, we might say, small, very, very tiny reproductive bodies of seed plants. So each of these grains, as you can see here, uh, has its very own unique shape, unique structure, and it depends, of course, on what plant it comes from. So, and the walls of the, the, this, those reproductive bodies are uh, made of sub substance known as sporopolene, and this is very, very chemically stable and very, very strong. Uh, so it, uh, it allows the pollen to survive for many, many, many years, as, as, as you will see. So uh, when pollen grains are washed or were washed or blown into some bodies of water, so this external wall, this external substance, protective substance, allows them to be preserved in uh, sediment layers in the bottoms of ponds, of lakes, or even of the, of the oceans. And now when they're found, because of their unique shapes, and as you can see here, uh, scientists can take, for example, a core sample of the sediment layer and determine what kind of plants were going at that time when this sediment was uh, deposited. So we determine time, age of the, uh, of the sample, and then we know what types of plants were growing in the area, which allows the scientists to presume climate at the time, using knowledge about, of course, no uh, modern, uh, but also uh, historical distributions of plants in, in relation to climate. So uh, we, have, we have a core sample, we find uh, pollen, uh, and de depending on what pollen uh, is, is found, we know that at that time, uh, for example, it was more humid or uh, or less humid, uh, so there, there was less rain or more rain, and of course the temperature as well. For example, um, uh, usually when spruce pollen is, is found, it means that at that time, at that period, at that place, it was rather uh, rather cold. So, it, but of course, it allows to conduct much more sophisticated research comparing trends in vegetation um, of course from, from from for example last few thousands uh, of years to recent trends in vegetation it also can help uh, can help scientists determine whether human activities had significant impact of, on ecosystems on uh, on plants uh, it, of course, it's not that only one pollen, one type of um, of plant proxy is found in in a sample. Uh, what needs to be done is a count of of pollen, count, count of these proxies, and which one is uh, which one is dominant. And uh, so, special diagrams of the type and abundance of pollen in in the samples are then generated. I mentioned three rings as a way to determine age, but also tree rings are, or trees are uh, proxies themselves. So fortunately, you don't have to cut down the tree to study tree rings. Um, so collecting a sample is, is possible with, uh, with uh, also with an instrument called an increment borer. It's here on the left on, on, on the photo. So it extracts like a thin strip of wood and this, this strip of wood goes all the way to the center of the tree and you pull the strip out and you can count the rings on the strip of wood. Uh, and this tree, of course, remain, remains uh, healthy. Another interesting technique, which allows us to go even further back in time, because trees have a rather limited 
time li lifespan and uh, what allows us to go a little bit further back in time is using wood from old buildings uh, especially especially in europe because you know in uh, at the time when they were cut down it was at least 500 600 uh, years ago so we can go back from from there what is identified uh, identified um, thanks thanks to tree rings uh, it allows uh, us to, to to determine how old the tree is or who was when it was cut down, but also what the weather was like uh, during the tree's lifespan each year, because there are two types of rings. So one is light colored and one is dark, dark colored, and there are those those two types of rings indicate two types of growth. So wood that grew in the spring and early summer that is um, this light color, these are these light color rings and dark rings are it, it is wood that grew in the late summer and in the fall, not, not in winter. So one light ring and one dark ring that gives us one year of the tree's life. Of course, in real life, it doesn't look uh, so perfect, as perfect as on this picture. It's, it's quite often quite quite difficult to uh, to identify uh, those rings, but also sometimes um, there, you can come across something interesting like a scar, a sort of a scar which uh, indicates that there was a forest fire, but this particular tree actually uh, survived. And based on those uh, tree rings, we can, uh, for example, see how the tree growth in what well, the tree growth in northern Europe uh, or in other regions uh, looked like. So was there more growth on, and less growth? And in general, um, this indicates that 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 when there it was rather warm and so the weather was warm, sunny, and and there was enough rain, so the growth is. Uh, significantly larger so this ring is thicker uh, just of course it's just a, a simplification but that's that's the general rule and this concept was actually is not a new concept at all it was actually described by Leonardo da Vinci himself another proxy which allows us to go really 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 deep dive deep back in time um, are planktonic records, and this might seem odd because plankton seems so uh, futile and so so uh, so not not durable, but not all plankton, of course. And one proxy that is widely used uh, are planktonic foraminifera, also called called forams for sure, uh, for short, and they're protist organisms. And they are protected, they can survive that long because they're protected again, just like the pollen was protected. Uh, forearms are protected by shells with our, which are multi-chambered uh, calcium car carbonate shells. And so this is one feature that allows them to survive for a, for a long time, or be, maybe not survive, be preserved for a long time because they're not living organisms anymore they're uh um they're, they're, they're only proxies and another feature is that they're very abundant or they were abundant so there were their abundance in this fossil record because for now they're only fossils so they are commonly used in uh, reconstructing records uh, of, of climate especially uh in paleo oceanography <laughs> So they allow us to recreate conditions in past in the oceans in the in the past, so the temperature and uh, salinity as well. Uh, so forums, uh, like I said, they're very very old records. They can give us data from millions of years ago. So we're back to Cambrian period, even not all of them, but some of them. And how are they uh, studied? uh so oh and another uh, another important feature is that they their temporal resolution that i mentioned is very uh, very exact so uh because they are 
in this protective sh shell that they carry, uh, they carry also very specific geochemical signatures. And those signatures can provide us valuable information on about the oceans, about ocean productivity and the temperature uh, as well. But mostly uh, how the past temperature is determined based on proxies. Uh, this is a little bit more complicated. Uh, uh, so it's again it's determined in in in, in two ways. First, uh, based on uh, isotopes of oxygen. So more heavy oxygen, uh, uh, oxygen eighteen uh, isotope uh, eighteen is found in shells of forums in the in the samples from the periods when the waters were cold. And in contrast, this lighter um, the forums with more lighter oxygen in them, their shells are dominant in, uh, when they're dominant, it indicates that the waters were a little bit warmer at the time. So this is one thing that involves um, studying uh, oxygen isotopes, but there is also a seemingly more simple way, because there is another very interesting feature that forums have. So they, uh, they come in two variations, at least not, not only one of them, but one of them in particular is very well known. One species is very well known and comes in two variations, uh, one with left coiling shells and one with right coiling shells. And again, uh, it's not that uh, only one type is found in one um, sample. Again, just like with pollen, they need to be counted and based on the counting percentage, it is determined uh, which um, which was which was dominant, and for some reason, uh, the one which is left coiling is dominant in colder waters, not, not in colder waters right now in cold in waters that were colder when they were alive, and this so-called dextral, so so right coiling, is dominant in warmer water, so it's an indication of a warmer climate. So again, account needs to be done, and uh, if, uh, for example, a uh, less coiling uh, type of uh, this type of forum is dominant, that means that oh, probably it, the water was colder. And also, uh, of course, uh, it's not the only factor. And like I said, more proxies are needed to uh, to be sure or to be more certain about the conditions. And now something that really uh, seems naturally related to, to, to the Arctic, but like I said, we'll, we'll come to that. So the ice cores as proxies, but more as archives of proxies. That will be more, more accurate because uh, ice cores, uh, which are drilled uh, from ice caps or glaciers, are great archives for lots of information uh, from, uh, from, from back in time, information indicating uh, past climate. So uh, probably they're actually the most comprehensive types of proxy. So this is again why the Arctic is one of the most uh, important sources of information about past climate. Um, so physical chemical analysis of ice cores provides information again temperature precipitation also atmospheric ar arousals such as for example dust or volcanic ash and volcanic ash uh, shows us that, oh maybe there was a, a huge uh, volcanic eruption or a series of volcanic eruption and eruptions at at some point in time it even indicates levels of solar activity. So, and another great feature of ice cores as proxies or archives, they can provide 
data with a resolution as fine as annual resolution, yearly uh, resolution. So, and some of the records span periods of hundreds of thousands of years. So maybe not millions of years, just like in case of forums, but still pretty good, uh, pretty good results. Uh, so the first ice cores are extracted from uh, glaciers, but the most interesting ones are from the, the ice caps and uh, from from ice sheets uh, in general, especially from two locations, uh, from the Antarctic and from Greenland. They're the most uh, interesting sources of information and of uh, locked in uh, locked in ice cores. Um, and they're typically removed not, I mean, the ice cores can be really, really long, like one kilometer long, long but does, it doesn't mean that they're drilled like that and pulled, uh, it wouldn't be possible to pull a uh, one kilometer long uh, ice core at once. They're removed in sections, uh, usually six meter long sections, and uh, it includes many repetitions and pulling uh, ice cores out. They are they're then cut very precisely, cut into segments. Uh, they're very very um, accurately cleaned, and um, of course they're very very delicate and they need to be kept in a deep freeze during their transport. Uh, of course, uh, they need to be uh, at least some of them. They, they need to be melted at some point to uh, determine what's what was trapped, uh, what was trapped inside. Uh, I mentioned that uh, Greenland and uh, Antarctic are the most, are, are the richest sources of ice cores, and that, that's true, um, because the, those this, these ice layers can become really, really deep and thick over over time. So, uh, for example, East Antarctic ice sheet, uh, it's more than four. Four and a half kilometers thick, in some places at least, and that means millions and millions of years of of record. So, what can be trapped? Uh, uh, what can be trapped in in there, and what is being studied while studying uh, ice cores? Uh, so, for example, the measurement of gas composition. It's a very direct measurement so uh, tiny bubbles on of literally ancient air are trapped in deep ice cores and these uh, this can be of course extracted analyzed using um, some sophisticated equipment such as max, uh, mass uh, uh, spectrometers uh, so this is the composition of air uh, for example, how much CO2, how much carbon dioxide was there, which, as we know, uh, is strictly related to the temperature. But the temperature, in contrast, is not measured that directly, it cannot be. Uh, but again, just like in case of forums, it is, um, it is inferred from, from isotopic composition. Uh, this time it's from the isotopic uh, composition of water molecules and water molecules of course are released by melting the uh, the ice cores so then we are able to compare was it warmer or was it colder with particular uh, air composition at that period so the, the, again the does it, the isotopes which are of particular interest for the climate studies are oxygen and, and hydrogen uh, this time as well. And um, or, um, all those isotopes which are uh, of interest in that case, again, uh, oxygen 16, oxygen 18, uh, and also <coughs> uh, hydrogen uh, isotopes uh, are considered very stable because they do not undergo radioactive decay. Uh, in some cases also uranium is used, but it's used mostly to date, I mean to determine the age of some ice cores and mostly uh, for, in case of ice cores from, from, uh, from Antarctica. 
So again, then we can produce those graphs um, indicating a uh, connection between, for, for example, CO2, uh, CO2 in the atmosphere and temperature, but also other factors such as dust, volcanic ash. Uh, we usually see that uh, with a higher amount, higher content of, of the ash, the temperature usually tends to get uh, get lower. And only a very short, I would like to mention it very shortly about cosmogenic uh, isotopes, uh, which can be also very useful, mostly as an indicator of uh, of solar activity. As we know, the solar activity is not constant. It's, it comes in cycles, but it can differ from cycle to cycle. Uh, it, its intensity can differ so from cycle to cycle, and also all, not all the cycles are, are the same, and there are different phases. And also to identify those cycles, we also needed to collect data from past um, uh, from past climate conditions. That is one thing, but mostly from uh, we needed to find something that indicates directly higher and lower solar activity. Because changes in solar activity within those cycles, uh, for example, does not only mean the fluctuation of the amount of energy that is being sent from the sun towards the earth and reaching the earth, rather reaching the earth. There are also other changes uh, that we can use. Uh, so there are changes, for example, in the intensity of the magnetic field and magnetic field of course spread by, by the sun and this field uh, protects the solar system from cosmic radiation uh, and it does rather a good job but it protects us more or less depending on the solar activity so the co those, this cosmic radiation those accelerated charged particles um, were once emitted in our galaxy and are just rushing through, through, through space. So when such particle, high energy cosmic ray molecule collides with something, with a rock, with soil, with atmosphere, it actually collides with atomic nucleus in this rock, for example, soil. Um, and it can undergo uh, transformations and cause the formation of some isotope, which is this time was not was not that stable. It's more like a radioactive isotope, and those isotopes would not normally exist like naturally on Earth. Uh, so the only way they can appear on Earth is because of this collision with cosmic uh, with cosmic rays with the and we, we, if we find a lot of those radioactive, not natural to Earth uh, isotopes, it means that there was a lot of collision. And if there was a lot of collision, then again, by proxy, we know that uh, we weren't that well protected by our star, by sun. And if we were not that well protected, if, if, uh, if a lot of collision was allowed, it means that this magnetic field, shield, uh, was not that strong. If it wasn't that strong, it means that we're in the lower phase of this solar activity. So very much in short, this is how um, a proxies of solar activity are used. And then again, they're also compared with, okay, does uh, high solar activity mean there's, it is always war or not, or does it usually show that? So this is another type of proxy with combined with those previously discussed uh, are, um, uh, are used. And as I promised, I would like to show you that um, not only those ice cores, which is obviously drawn from polar regions in general, uh, the Antarctic and also the Arctic uh, can be uh, classified as proxies used by paleoclimatologists to uh, to determine past climates, which are 
directly related to, to, to the Arctic. That's not the case because uh, now we do not identify Arctic with a lot of trees, with a, with a lot of uh, green, etc. But uh, as we know, the climate was changing in the past, so uh, it can be used as well. Uh, so this is an example of quite a recent study and the name of this study uh, is here. So this is the, the response of polar ecosystems to enhance warming, a comparative study between modern boreal forests and Pliocene Arctic forests. So it's not only determining the, uh, uh, the past conditions, but also showing how the ecosystems were responding to changing conditions. Actually, uh, mm, it, it turns out that Arctic, which is not, a, not doesn't come as a surprise, but Arctic ecosystems are very, very vulnerable in general. So they react even more intensely than the changes would make us think that they uh, that they would. Uh, so what was used in this study? And so the study was uh, was conducted using samples from High Arctic Beaver Pond site. It's uh, actually, it's, 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 it's Canada. So as you can see, it's very, very north. And on the right, you can see researchers actually tank, taking samples and the conditions that are there. And on the left, it's of course only a representation, an uh, illustration of what it looked like in the period that the conditions were compared to. So what they were, were they using? They were using three, Mm, three records, three proxies, three independent pro proxy records. I, they were uh, focused on temperature records, and it was from uh, early Pliocene. And it, the samples were drawn for taken from peat deposits in, uh, as I mentioned, in Canadian High Arctic. So uh, this is where this illustration on the left came uh, from, the, because they estimate that. Uh, in that period, a, the mean annual temperature uh, in this environment was almost 20 Celsius degrees warmer than uh, than today. Uh, uh, so the temperatures were very, very, very different from what they are today, but they compared it with CO2 levels, and the CO2 levels were not were higher than at present at that time uh, at the place uh, but it, the the difference was not that significant and this drew them to the conclusion that uh, even a small change in co2 was very very significant for the conditions in uh, in the area as it is stated here they are highly sensitive to greenhouse uh, gases, but what were uh, the pro the proxies? So uh, again, the the temperatures were determined based on isotopes, oxygen isotopes, and it was based on fossil trees and and mosses, also with annual growth rings in trees. So we know that there were trees uh, in the past, and there were fossil trees that could be also uh, studied. Also, vegetation uh, composition. Vegetation composition can be determined using pollen found, found uh, in samples. Uh, and also uh, a very uh, much uh, less intuitive, I would say, a more sophisticated proxy, uh, which was a distribution on, on membrane lipids in soil bacteria. And they, they seem to correlate to temperature, but this is, this is another very, very sophisticated type of, of proxy. Uh, as you can see, they can be as almost evident as tree rings, but also as sophisticated and not intuitive for a normal person, just like uh, membrane lipids composition find this in soil bacteria. So um, the Pliocene actually is a particularly interesting when compared with other ancient, even ancient intervals uh, of warm global mean temperatures, uh, because uh, the uh, this atmospheric CO2 levels uh, 
like I said, are estimated to have been like 390 parts per million by volume. So uh, only slightly higher than, not than today, than pre-industrial uh, levels. So it, it might also, open one, uh, um, one result and one um, uh, finding would be, okay, so the, uh, so those ecosystems are very, very fragile, very, very vulnerable to greenhouse effects, or maybe there were other, other factors that also influenced this, uh, this period in terms of uh, temperature. And uh, it's also very interesting that with all, uh, just to close our today's lesson, that we can almost draw, a, take, take a photo or draw a picture of uh, ancient, uh, ancient ecosystems, uh, even from, from Pliocene, so long, long time uh, ago. <laughs> um, so we can determine with high level of certainty what it looked like. So the site here in high Arctic, this beaver pond site, uh, we know that it was much warmer, more, much more lush and, and there were cedar trees, mosses, herbs, fish, frogs, uh, also some extinct um, mammals that included like tiny deer and some ancient relatives of modern animals like black bear, uh, some horses, small beavers, rabbits, and etc. So this is also an interesting uh, possibility that polar climatology uh, gives us. So thank you very much for uh, listening to our today's lesson.